everyone. Welcome to the Goodman Podcast. Today we have a very, very inspiring entrepreneur with, 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 with us. He has, I know him because we joined the EO Bangkok chapter recently. Uh, I, I heard his story, the first time I heard his story, big fan of what he's done and how he's bucked the trend as it were in the Thai market and beyond. Um, presenting Nakren. Nakren, love you to have you on. Why don't you introduce yourself first for the, for the listeners to, to know who you are and what you do? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Thank you for the introduction. I think uh, he's uh, oversold me uh, slightly, but <laughs> very happy to be here and uh, very happy to share what I've done and the learnings that I've had so far. So my name is Nakrin. I'm born and raised in Thailand, but I've done a lot of my undergraduate and graduate studies overseas in, in the U.S., uh, I'm currently working in FMCG in consumer goods, and I started off actually wanting to do a search fund whereby I was looking for SME businesses in Thailand and Malaysia to acquire. Subsequently found a business in consumer goods, and specifically in herbal shampoos that was for sale, which was very interesting because we felt that it was a nice niche market where a Thai brand will be a likely leader in. Um, and we acquired that business in 2016 and have been running it for seven and a half years now. And the business has done quite well. And so we've expanded the company vision to be a multi-brand, house of brands company, but focused on Thai, natural and healthy brands. And hopefully in doing so, we'll be able to not only build a, a financially stronger business, since all the brands in under our portfolio would share the same indirect costs, same sales channel, but over time actually uh, understand the Thai natural healthy consumer better than any other consumer company and be able to develop products and communicate to them in a way that is superior to any other consumer company being a one brand uh, company. Um, and, and so the vision is actually to, to deepen our share of wallet of this particular target group, which we think is growing relative to the general mass market. Understood. And that, that's very, very inspiring. Tell me why, why this category? I mean, obviously, there are many growing FMCG categories. Why this category is something which you fell in love with or is something you saw that has a, has a potential? What was the thought process in selecting one FMCG category as well? Okay, so I, that's a great question. So the, the truth of it is that actually when we entered this category or in consumer goods generally, uh, it was actually an accident. It was not something that was planned. But the opportunity to acquire this brand came on the table, so we evaluated it based on the fact that the opportunity was on the table. Now, the reason we like the opportunity from a market perspective is twofold. One, we felt that within consumer in Thailand, there is a general trend that is moving towards Thai brands, towards natural products, towards organic chemical-free products. And within that subsegment, albeit small, the competition is nowhere near as fierce as playing in the mass market where you're competing with the likes of Pantene and Dove. And in this subsegment or in this niche, uh, the real winner is likely going to be a Thai brand. And the, the winner of this subsegment, which is poised to grow, will likely be able to maintain a leading position right. much longer period of time. So from a market perspective, you know, we saw that the the consumers were wanting products of this sort. The competition was not really that sophisticated relative to the, the larger chunk of the pie. And uh, Thailand itself actually is very well uh, developed when it comes to the infrastructure of the production and research and development of cosmetic products. In Thailand, a lot of the global MNC players uh, historically have set up their own production here, and that has led to an ecosystem being built of universities churning out students who are well researched or well educated on high herbs, on cosmetic ingredients, on the production of cosmetics generally as a category and personal care as a category. So 
from a supply perspective, it was not something that we couldn't do. It was widely available. The OEM infrastructure was there. The manufacturers were here. And uh, from a demand perspective, we saw that the demand was flowing this way as well. And it also happens to be a category that has pretty high gross margins, which is also very attractive when it comes to trying to scale your business. That's phenomenal. It's, it, as it happens, uh, I didn't know the brand. And then when I go back home and I, I, I realized that I, every bathroom has your product. And, and obviously my, my wife has, has bought it because you know she's a savvy one, she's a buyer. She's the one who actually buys for the entire household. So she has it stocked up everywhere. We've got several bottles ready to be used as soon as the one gets over. So yeah, we, we are stocked up. And I mean, that's the interesting thing that there is a lot of awareness already amongst consumers, especially, uh, I, I guess, in, in my household, definitely my wife is the one who's most savvy about this. How do you go about promoting marketing or making people aware of, of natural products or herbal or organic? I, I don't know, you mentioned natural, but I don't, I don't know what other ways you can uh, talk about it, but how do you make people aware of it, uh, perhaps both for local market and also expats coming in, living in, uh, the Thai market as well. To be honest, this is an area that I don't think we've done that good of a job in yet. Uh, because, you know, we just did a big user and attitude uh, survey and it turns out over like 95% of the Thai population haven't even heard of our brand before. Um, and so that's a clear signal to us that actually our brand awareness, especially the the herbal shampoo brand is is actually very very low, and, and it's good and bad. It's good it's good in the sense that we still have ninety five percent opportunity for us to try and tackle, and there's still ninety five percent of the population that we can still go after that we can convert to our customer. But it's also bad in the sense that we, it's a signal that we haven't really done. Um, we haven't chosen the right activity mix to reach uh, the mass market, generally speaking. Um, so to be honest, I think the, the only thing I can share on that front that's useful is that like any small brand, we've been relying on word of mouth as a way to generate awareness and trial and consideration. Um, we have, you know, we have done some digital marketing because we feel that we can target our, the natural high consumer better, but again, we're not, we're not. We're not convinced that that has been superly successful. We have done out of home, but we have not done mass media like TVCs, cinema. Um, uh, yeah, so, 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 yeah, we've been relying predominantly on digital and word of mouth. And so far, the results are not that encouraging. Understood. And it's obviously. One thing I'll say is again, I'm, I'm guessing how my wife found found you is that you know, the, the distribution is is really good. I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's stock all around. Tell us a little bit about the distribution. How did you go about that? How did that happen? Was it organic? Was it sort of done uh, early on or later on in the seven years so far? So uh, we we actually started off with some level of distribution to begin with. Uh, prior to acquisition, the, the brand had already develop distribution in a lot of modern trade outlets. It's a 30 year old brand. So you can imagine when, when 7-Eleven, when Big C, when Tesco Lotus came to Thailand, it was one of the few local brands that they could have approached to list the products in. So the products were already in these channels, but there were just one or two SKUs. And the previous owner hadn't actually pushed it at all, hadn't really worked with the retailers in developing a business plan, a trade plan that would actually encourage trials and growth within those channels. So we came in, we started cultivating uh, personal relationships with the buyers and the merchandisers for all the modern trade retailers. We started bringing to them a clear plan on what we would do in terms of in-store activities, promotional activities, and also a couple uh, that with new products that we are planning to launch and marketing campaigns to support products that convince them uh, 
sufficiently to stock our new products into their shelves as well. And so I wouldn't say that our, our distribution strategy has been uh, a lot of opening new stores, but it has been more about developing, uh, about listing additional SKUs, planning the correct assortment for the stores that we were already in. Understood. And obviously, there is, there seems to be more awareness, or at least from what I'm seeing, it, it was, before I was in Thailand, I was, I was in the UK, and I still, you know, I'm back and forth. There seems to be a lot of discussions about herbal, natural, organic products. And I'm, the question I have for you is, do you see that there's a, there's a, a bias or more growth towards perhaps expats or foreigners living in the country? Or would you say that the local population ties as well, obviously ties who have, like yourself, who have been abroad and come back in, also buying? What, what's the distribution would you say, uh, obviously, have, you know, as open as you can be or, or perhaps you can't? I would say that our, our brand is 95% targeted at locals. There, are, there is a group of tourists who buy the products as a souvenir as well, as in they think that Thai her, they're, they're here on vacation in Thailand. Thailand is a great production base for personal care, cosmetic products, and they see a Thai local brand using Thai herbs, it becomes a nice souvenir for them to take back. So that's maybe 5% of our, our sales, but the majority of it is actually targeted at local types. Yeah. And you'll see in our product line, most of our products actually utilize uh, ingredient that is grown in Thailand. So for example, our best selling product is leech lime shampoo. Leech lime is well known amongst Thais as a great fruit to help with hair loss. And when I was growing up, for example, when I, when I needed to wash my hair, my mom or my grandma would cut leech lime, fresh leech lime, and then they would squeeze it onto your head, you know, um, and they would say it helps with hair growth and it helps with, with hair retention and preventing hair loss. So our, our brand is about, about taking well, well aware, uh, well believed traditional Thai ingredients for particular benefits and then packaging it in a, in a way to reach the Thai consumer that is much more convenient, that is, uh, easier to use that incorporates some element of modern innovation so that they they don't have to trade off functionality or usage to use an ingredient they want to use or they already do. You know, because the consumer is actually we, we, we grow up with our own beliefs in what herbs and what ingredients that are are cultivated on our lands are beneficial. Um, and in some ways, Thailand has one of the largest biodiversities when it comes to plants out of every country in the whole wide world. So some of, you know, relative to uh, places like Europe or North America, we the, the diversity of plants here allows for uh, assortment of herbs and traditional ingredients that in some ways could be even more effective than our counterparts in other regions. That's that's really interesting. And uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, coming here, I see there is a, a big push towards, and always has been, I guess, you know, fresh fruit, fresh food, fresh fruits, uh, you name it, it's always available, living in, you know, hawkers have it, even the sort of, you know, street food has it. Hey, that's on the subject about North America and Europe. So let me talk to you a little bit about, or ask you a question about globalization or global markets, for example. This time around, when I was in uh, in the UK, just literally a couple of weeks back, I went to Harris with my wife, and Harris being the, the global, you know, really popular retail store for luxury end. I saw a couple of Indian brands, uh, Karma, Ayurvedic, and of course, Essentials. I don't know if that's an Indian brand. I think it is for the Indian brands, and they both were, were there. And my wife was a bit surprised to see them there. And she said, Wow, Indian brands are, are, are expanding to 
luxury space in the UK. So world, world domination. What are your thoughts on world, world domination in global markets? I think for us, uh, we're starting with Southeast Asia first when it comes to regional expansion, when it comes to uh, cross-border expansion. Uh, just because within Southeast Asia, the recognition of the Thai herbs and Thai ingredients are, are more commonplace um, than if we went to North America or Europe or even China. Just the region is familiar with the biodiversity and the plant grow here. So when we, for example, take our chimeric uh, you know, mask to, to Vietnam, the Vietnamese consumer is already aware of chimeric. Of course, they have their own set of herbs as well and their own set of beliefs as well, but there is some overlap. And so for us, the lowest hanging fruit would be to take our brand regional. Uh, of course, I think there are certain ingredients that Thailand is well recognized for globally, and Thailand exports spa products and also Thailand massage and Thai massage and Thai spa is well known globally as well. So by default, I think those the, that also exports well when it's globally recognized. But for us, you know, there are certain ingredients that. I think it would be a difficult sell to the North American market, like tamarind, which is very specific to Thailand for whitening, and uh, and even the benefit itself might not might not be something that is in demand uh, in places elsewhere. So uh, I, I don't know that this answers your question, but I think my my view on it is that it depends on how aware. The global, the, the exporting market is of that particular ingredient or benefit or product that is being exported from China. So I think, you know, Indian Ayurvedic medicine is much, is, is globally quite famous and increasingly so as well. So exporting it is not surprising to me. Um, exporting it to places like Harrods in the UK, it's not that it's not that surprising, but uh, it's because it, it, the the awareness and the recognition of the of Indian Ayurvedic medicine is already there. So it's not impossible. It's a matter of timing, and it's a matter of how how. We educate the markets we want to expand into about our ingredients and our benefits. Yep. Make so, make so. From a brand owner owner's perspective, we have to think about uh, prioritizing our markets based on complexity and also the biggest bang for our buck. So it comes back to why we prioritize the region because trying to convince uh a Vietnamese consumer to try a leech slime shampoo should be a lot easier than trying to than the same challenge towards a Japanese consumer, for example. Understood. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And just on on the idea of using natural products across and Thai predominantly Thai products or herbs uh, and other ingredients. Would you say that the ethos or the the value which you bring to the table also results, revolves around the idea of using ingredients which are has no nasties as it were? So perhaps paraben is one of the things I've heard about. It's pretty not really good for you. And you know when when we look into as a, as a consumer when we look to buy stuff in the UK, we go to Whole Foods for example, and just buy from there because we know everything over there. It's what's stocked there usually is it doesn't have you know the the e numbers for example it doesn't have paraben for instance so is that what you're trying to build as well and perhaps you can take an example of your, your top brand uh, because you have multi brand product uh, range so maybe your top brand name it and tell us what does it look like yeah definitely so so I think actually using natural ingredients natural extracts goes hand in hand with 
being free from harmful chemicals. So we're lucky the brand DNA from day one was a combination of trying to strip, to be as strict to the purest product, to the purest, to be as pure natural as possible. And when you're as pure natural as possible, you're trying to substitute out all these nasties with natural alternatives that it's it's very similar to to you know the the case of uh, uh, of uh, I think the uh, you know it's 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 uh, it just goes hand in hand you know if you if today you're trying to 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 take out the nasties, you do need to substitute it with something else. In our case, we're just trying to substitute it with something that is natural instead. Um, and say, same thing today, the natural also involves using a very high percentage of actual natural uh, active ingredients. So for us, we, we see it as going hand in hand. You can't, you can probably do a very high percentage of natural active ingredients and still have some nasties in there. But in the minds of the consumer, they're actually expecting both. When, when they're looking for natural products, generally speaking, and it's it's not fair. I think in the if we don't think it's fair when when a brand takes a product to the market that claims to be natural but contains a bunch of uh, nasty chemicals there because you're trying to communicate to a sensitive consumer about your product being natural and their expectation is a little bit of both. You know, to give. Um, you know, I think just a good example where where possible, we would actually make something that is completely 100% natural. So one of the best selling and most innovative products that we did was we realized that, you know, Thai, Thais uh, believe in the power of tamarind, for example. They, they believe that tamarind uh, helps with uh, brightening and whitening and taking out double skills, double cells from your skin. And for ages, you know, uh, Thai consumers, Thai ladies would actually take tamarind, the wet tamarind that they used to make food, and then blend it up, you know, add turmeric, add milk, and create it as a body scrub, face scrub. And uh, we realized, hey, you know, there, there is this, there is this already innate belief in it, and tamarind is already very high in natural HA, which is the function of it. Um, you know, and, and we saw a famous Thai blogger uh, post her own natural uh, recipe for creating a mask using tamarind. And at that same time, we realized, hey, one of the biggest trends in personal care was a mask sachets, or, or actually like you know, just general serum sachets or single-use pods. So we were one of the first brands to to help create a uh, fully 100% natural tamarind paste in a pot form that that um, a consumer could buy for uh, 29 baht, you know, a little bit less than a dollar uh, per piece. It's a one-time use. You don't have to go to your kitchen, make your own kind of tamarind just because you want to use it once, you know, and, and waste up all these materials that is required for use. And, uh, we we co-developed this with uh, Thailand's number one beauty blogger, and then we launched it, and it was a complete success. And it it very much fits with the brand DNA of leveraging ingredients for functional benefits that the Thai people already believe in, but bringing it to the Thai consumer in uh, in a way that is functionally easier, you know, in a uh, and delivering it with convenience at a price point that is still affordable. So the tamarind mass, for example, is sold through 7-Eleven. I think 11,000 branches, and it was must have sold it like four or five million pieces at least um, since launch. So, so it's, it's a, just an example of something that, that we do as well. And it's 100% natural, no preservatives, uh, and it's in a single use mass, and that's that's why we can do it as well. You know, once it's sealed shut, it's very difficult for for water and bacteria to get in. And naturally, tamarind is already slightly acidic, so it doesn't lend itself to bacterial growth.
That's a phenomenal success story, by the way. And congratulations on that one. That sounds like a really good win. And uh, apart from everything else you talked about, you talked about the sort of sort of you touched on the topic of influencers, and I wanted to kind of dive a little deeper on that. That's okay. Sort of partnerships which you might do. Obviously, the beauty industry, fashion industry. We see so many of these um, these influencers, bloggers, TikTokers, are you using those those uh, wonderful creatures of God where, where they have come into, into being at, and many brands say that they're essential? Uh, so that's one question. Second question, just within that, do you think there's a, a value in sort of core branding? I mean, obviously, famously, uh, Air Jordans, you know, sell more than any other Nike shoes, for instance. So, you see that that's something which you'll be looking to explore as well in the future. So our Tamarind line, for example, is co-branded. It's co-branded between our brand and Thailand's number one beauty influencer. Um, and that's been, you know, very, it's a, it's been a success. So from the Tamarind mask, we launched Tamarind body scrub and we launched Tamarind serum, cream gel, now getting into the lotion segment as well. Eventually we'll stop at probably a body wash. But, but that's, you know, it, it's, it's exactly the Air Jordan model, uh, just re redone in the cosmetics uh, industry. And instead of using an athlete with a beauty blogger, it's that. So the beauty blogger gets a share, a royalty based on the sales of products. And, and uh, she, in return, helps to promote it as if it was on her own if she helped to create the product, which is true. And uh, yeah, there's been a success for her. It, it's win win in the sense that she's a beauty blogger. And she doesn't have to actually create her own brand so to isolate herself out from reviewing other beauty products. But at the same time, as a beauty blogger, you also want passive income. You want to be able to get the rewards of some of the promotions and the work that you do in trying to help brands build uh, customer trials and awareness. So, in that sense, our partnership has worked out very well. Um, and it was one of the guess the, the highest ROI marketing investments that we made when we were trying to build our brand. So as you can imagine, when we started seven, eight years ago, the brand was very small and we didn't have a lot of marketing dollars or marketing time out to put it in. Going to a beauty blogger and structuring it in a way that she would get some royalty uh, and very little in terms of fixed fee and very little in terms of what we had to put in for media was very good ROI for us, uh, given the returns were variable rather than fixed, because a lot of marketing is more fixed in nature in terms of uh, cost structure. But in this case, we were able to variableize it, which fit very well with our with our size at that particular point in time. Uh, our experience so far using beauty bloggers and influencers is that you have to choose them carefully because not all bloggers and influencers are the same. Some have a much more loyal following and credibility amongst their followers than others. So uh, even looking at just the number of people who follow them or the number of people who like their page is, isn't sufficient. In fact, even just look, looking at the comments that are under their posts is insufficient because it doesn't always convert to sale or trial unless their follower base actually believes in what the reviewer, influencer, or blogger is actually saying. So, so I think we have to choose carefully, and we've burned our fingers a few times as well choosing uh, bloggers and influencers uh, incorrectly. Understood. Understood. And obviously, this always is tricky to find that one person who will carry the burden of the brand as it were or to really help it push push forward a question linked to that that topic and this was to my, some of the last questions here uh, which is often you see that brand owners the company owners become the brand ambassadors famously richard richard branson is the brand ambassador for virgin whether it's you know virgin media internet or virgin rockets or train you know, he's literally everywhere. And then there are others 
we prefer to have, as we discussed earlier, Michael Jordan to come in uh, to kind of be the, the brand ambassador for it. Where do you see yourself and your co-founder to be brand ambassadors, for example? And I mean, again, because and this is something which, I, which I, I, I often talk about to people, especially in B two C space. Like, do you see that that's going to become your role in the future as ambassadors, as influencers, or do you feel like there is a place for entrepreneurs in certain segments, and perhaps not for all segments, maybe not for beauty and uh, fashion and 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 health and others? Yeah. Well, firstly, uh. uh... I don't think I have the the good looks to be a brand ambassador for uh, for our brands. Uh, it's just uh, I think it's it's not what the the Thai female consumer is looking for. Um, but just generally speaking, I think both me and my co-founder we're we're more about building businesses from process people systems perspective rather than trying to be a blogger and influencer on our own personalities. I think, you know, when you ask that question, I think it's it's a personal choice to make. If someone who wants to be the brand ambassador for their own brand is probably someone who wants the spotlight, who enjoys the public attention, who is an influencer or blogger by default. You know, today, if you're already an influencer or blogger, you're passionate about influencing uh, other people and you already have a loyal follower base and, and you want to launch a brand that is resonant of your personality uh, you have full right to and you will be very successful at doing that if you're, if you're very good and then there are some brands that have different values and perhaps the value of the brands don't necessarily overlap with the values of the founder and that's fine too um, and I think we're much more on that path because our vision is not one brand. Our vision is a house of brands and a house of brands that is actually, that might mean that is targeting different age groups all the way from mom and baby, you know, babies to adults to the elderly. And the right value set for each brand will be slightly different. And we cannot be an embodiment of all the values for all our brands. What we're trying to build here, our vision, uh, our, our strategy is is doesn't is not conducive to having our personalities become the ambassadors of the brands that are here. And I think we're much more excited about building the right process and systems to maintain. And even the right marketing processes so that our brands can meet the needs and communicate to our their target customer better than any other brand can. And and I think that's that's going to have to allow for some flexibility when it comes to values and the right ambassadors, the right influencers that will be that will portray the image of those brands. Understood. That's actually a very good answer. Um, by the way, I, I must say I disagree with one thing. You got you got great skin, and you haven't turned gray, unlike myself. So something is definitely working for, for you. You've definitely got good good DNA there, um, and and then good genes. So um, awesome. That that that's great. Um, so Nakin, where can the audience, the listeners, the the viewers can find you if they want to like follow you and follow your journey? Uh, across the success you're currently seeing and in the future? So um, definitely you can find me on LinkedIn. I message me at any time, um, Nakra Nurula. Uh, and otherwise, yeah, I think by email is a great way to contact me. I, I don't maintain a very active public profile, um, but, but happy to chat, happy to share what I've learned and done so far and happy to be connected. Excellent. Nakren, thank you very much for your time today, my friend. And thank you for being today the Good Wooden Podcast. I know I've learned a lot from you. And I'm sure the audiences have, have as well. They'll be just bringing this across a multiple channels. So you get a lot of people hearing your, your message and what you've built over here. Well done, you, sir. Thank you, Raj, for inviting me. Uh, 
I hope it has been useful and I look forward to doing more of these and hearing from some of our listeners who find this topic interesting. And thank, thank you, Raj, for the invitation again. Absolute pleasure. Thank you.